Most people believe that they have something called freedom of will. And even if they can't explain how this freedom could fit in with the laws of nature, they feel they have it. We know that everything arises based on prior causes. In particular, all of our conscious states, our thoughts, intentions, desires, and the actions and choices born of them arise on the basis of neurophysiological events of which we are not conscious and did not bring into being. You didn't pick your parents. You didn't pick your genes. You didn't pick the environment into which you were born. And yet the totality of these facts determine who you are in each moment and what you do in the next. And even if you think you must have an immaterial soul somehow animating the clockwork, you didn't pick your soul. And yet most people still feel that they are free to think and do more or less whatever they want in the present moment. They feel that if they could rewind the movie of their lives and bring the universe to the precise state it was in a moment ago, they could behave differently. If you rewound the movie of my life, it seems that I could finish this sentence some other way. But there's absolutely no reason to believe that this is true. There's no physical reason. There's no non-physical reason. And as I hope to show you, there is no experiential reason either. And it's this subjective sense of free will that makes it seem like a great philosophical problem that resists explanation. Most people believe that the challenge is to reconcile a subjective fact that we experience free will with objective reality, the way physical causes and events arise in the universe. But I want you to reconsider this. My claim is that we do not experience freedom of will and that our subjective experience is totally compatible with the truth of determinism, or determinism plus randomness. And it should be clear that randomness doesn't give any more basis for free will than the flipping of a coin would. What I hope to impress on you is that the illusion of free will is itself an illusion. There is no illusion of free will. And there are no subjective facts to reconcile with the truths of physics and neurophysiology. Now I should say at this point that some people don't like this idea at all. Some, in fact, feel psychologically disturbed by it. Many people who don't like to be told that free will is a fiction often worry that the consequences of believing this will be negative. Now, obviously, this isn't an argument against the truth of the idea. But generally speaking, this claim isn't true either. Losing one's belief in free will can have very positive consequences. In particular, it removes any rational basis for hating other people. And I'll explain why this is so in a later lesson. I want you to consider the subjective experience of free will. And this is an exercise you might want to return to in the coming weeks, once you get more training in meditation. The goal of this consideration is to notice that your experience of your own thoughts, intentions, and actions is perfectly compatible with the absence of free will. And that however thoughts, intentions, and actions arise, whether they are lawfully determined by prior causes, or there is some element of randomness involved, your experience of being in the world doesn't show any trace of free will. You, the conscious witness of your inner life, aren't the author of your thoughts, intentions, and actions. Rather, thoughts, intentions, and subsequent actions simply arise to be noticed. Now, this doesn't mean there's no difference between voluntary and involuntary action. There is. Voluntary actions are associated with intentions. Voluntary actions can be consciously withheld. Voluntary actions can be deterred. An involuntary action, like a muscle spasm, can't. What someone does voluntarily, perhaps after hours or days of deliberation, says much more about him and about what he's likely to do in the future than an involuntary action does. With or without free will, stepping on a person's toe on purpose is different from doing it by accident. It says much more about you as a person and as I'll make clear later on, most of our ethical judgments remain unchanged when we give up the illusion of free will. But not everything remains unchanged. And in my experience, the changes are very beneficial. Let's consider how our thoughts arise, as they're the basis for our most complex and deliberate actions. If you pay attention to the flow of thought, you'll see that your thoughts simply appear in consciousness, very much like my words. In fact, if you pay attention you can observe that you no more decide the next thing you think than the next thing I say. What are you going to think next? You don't know. And yet your thoughts determine what you will want and intend and do in the future. 
Your thoughts determine your goals and whether or not you believe that you've met them. They determine what you say to other people and what you don't say. Thoughts, in fact, determine almost everything that makes you human. Most people think that they are the thinker of their thoughts and therefore their author. But subjectively speaking, there is no thinker to be found apart from the thoughts themselves. This is why the illusion of free will is directly connected to the illusion that there is a self or an ego riding around in your head. And that's a topic we'll explore in great depth later on. The feeling that there's a thinker in addition to the flow of thought is what it feels like to be thinking without knowing that you're thinking. It's the feeling of being identified with the train of thought that's passing through consciousness in this moment. But if you pay attention to how thoughts arise, you will see that they just appear in consciousness. You're not free to choose them before they appear. That would demand that you think them before you think them. If you can't control your next thought, if you can't decide what it will be before it arises, where is your freedom of will? At this moment, you might be thinking, what the hell is he talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. You didn't choose that thought either. If you're confused by what I'm saying, you didn't produce your confusion. You didn't decide to be confused. Conversely, if you understand what I'm saying and find it interesting, you didn't create that state of mind either. And if your mind is just wandering to thoughts of lunch and you missed half of what I just said, you didn't choose to do that with your attention. Everything is just happening. And this includes your thoughts, intentions, and desires, and your most deliberate actions. Now, many people fear that this is somehow disempowering. On the contrary, it can be incredibly empowering to realize this. If you pay attention to how thoughts arise and how decisions get made moment to moment, you will see that there's no evidence for free will. Our experience of being in the world is, in fact, totally compatible with the truth of determinism. And as we will see, this has implications not only for our ethics and our view of other people, but for our sense of self. And cutting through the illusion that there's an unchanging self riding around in your head can be an extraordinarily positive thing to do. It is arguably the deepest purpose of meditation. But of that, more later.